Welcome to Sober Solutions. We are a weekly recovery podcast, not affiliated with any particular 12-step or recovery program. However, you may hear us mention them. My name is Jason, and I'm an alcoholic and addict. My name is Chris, and I'm an alcoholic and addict. My name is Ben. I'm an alcoholic and addict. And welcome back to Sober Solutions Podcast. Tonight is episode 52, and we are very excited to have Ben back with us. Hey, Ben, how have you been? I have been wonderful, Jason. How have you been? Pretty good. Pretty good. Um, You know, just keeping busy. Uh, Work's been pretty crazy, but manageable. We both passed two years of sobriety, so congratulations to you. Yeah, same to you. So what else has been up with your life? Well, um, I had a baby. Well, I didn't have the baby. I was responsible for making the baby, though. I appreciate you bringing up two years because... It feels like yesterday that we were at one year, and it feels like a billion years ago at the same time, which I feel like a completely different person, and not because I'm usually covered in spit up now. It's been challenging. I was in my meeting this morning, and there was a a speaker meeting, and, and this girl was talking about how she had tried to get sober, she had tried to get sober, and... Every time she relapsed, it's because she just wasn't willing to deal with the challenges. And it eventually got to a point where she kept relapsing. And she had this, you know, spiritual moment of the challenges will never go away. And that's true. Like, the challenges don't go away. Getting back into parenting at you know, 37 going on 38. I'm, I am not a young buck anymore. It's not something that I'm incapable of, you know, and I've mentioned on the podcast before, you know, being a dad was one of the things that I, you know, I wanted from the time I was a young adult. And unfortunately, I never got the chance to be a truly sober dad, husband, partner during the, you know, the lives of my first two girls. So having a third girl, I don't know, I just make girls at this point, which is fine because I, you know, my nephew, he's a handful. Boys are just a whole different ball of wax. With the boys, I think he expects trips to the ER at a young age. And I think what I'm learning with girls is that if you don't handle it right, you're going to end up with trips to therapy for them at some point too. Actually, both of my girls do therapy and teaching them at now 11 and 7 how to process emotions, talk about emotions, talk about feelings. That's something that I couldn't even do for myself. I didn't even understand that for myself. Um, And I've only learned that in the last two years. So to be able to talk with them now and kind of, you know, truly go through that journey together of being able to deal with the challenges that we all face. Just because we're sober doesn't mean everything's easier, but it makes handling things a lot easier. It's been a hell of a two years, I'll put it that way. We're a long way from the smoke huts, but we're not that far away, which is a good thing. Well, you were just talking about having babies spit up on you, and I can only imagine the kind of spit ups that we had on when we were all drunk and wasted all the time. I mean, growing up in sobriety is kind of like raising a child. One thing that you were talking about is processing emotions, and I'm really interested to get your opinion on what your emotions and feelings are to be the sober dad now versus what you knew of being the alcoholic dad. What kind of things are you going through right now or anything? Honestly, that's something that I get to face every single day and be reminded of the two experiences And, you know, there'll be times where she's crying and either she's too full or she's not full enough or she's got gas or she's got a dirty diaper or she's overtired or those things don't bother me anymore. They bothered the hell out of me with my first two girls because it was preventing me from being able to do the things that I wanted to do. And that wasn't always drinking. I didn't start drinking heavily until my oldest daughter was a year old, I was just getting into that. But but the feeling then was I'm being prevented from doing what I want to do, which is the self-centered nature of addiction. It is 
about us, it's about me and my agenda and the things that I want to do. And now that stuff, I don't have anything that I want to do because living presently, living in the moment, doesn't allow me to fast forward to the next thing, doesn't allow me to get upset about a crying baby because that, she's a crying baby and that's what she's supposed to do. That's her role in my life right now. It's to let me know when she's, um, you know, upset or uncomfortable, and it's my job to handle it to the best of my ability. So, yeah, when you when you juxtapose the two um, experiences, they really couldn't be further from each other. But in th this kind of circuitous nature, the improvement that I'm having as a father of a newborn is spilling over into my ability to be a, a dad of an 11 going on 12 year old and a seven year old. And I kind of expected to be a better version of myself to Avery, our newborn. I didn't necessarily expect that those improvements would be seen with my other two, with Julia and Anna. Boys are a menace, I'll say that. And I have been to the ER multiple times in the last two years. Whereas my daughter, and I'm not just saying this because she's my daughter, I believe she's like a little angel and my son is a menace. Love them both to death, but yes, it is true, at least at this young age. And I think to summarize what you're saying, you're able to show up, you're able to be present. You know, you, it's not that you were a bad father before, but even from my perspective, I wasn't present. I think that was the biggest difference between then and now. Kids are very smart. When I show up to my daughter's golf lessons or her ski lessons, or when she played soccer or, you know, these team activities, a lot of parents are drinking on the sideline. They are huffing and puffing that they have to wake up at 10 a.m., spend three hours in the heat, do this. At the end of it, my daughter runs up and I'm actively participating and it's exciting. And you could see the difference of emotion with the parents that are sitting on the sidelines drinking, not present, you know, like on their phones. And not that all these parents are alcoholics. They're just not presently engaged with their children. And what I love about being sober at this point is I could truly say I'm doing the best I can. And in the future, I was there. And it's not just physically being there, it's mentally being there. One of the things our IOP therapist talked about, and I've mentioned this before, is you have 100 marbles and you have to put them into various buckets. And before, a lot of those marbles were put into your addiction, you know, how to get the next XYZ, you know, consuming the time, the time before and the time after. And now it frees up a lot of time for the things that are needed to be a parent, also the things that are needed to fuel yourself to be a better person and parent. And that's the biggest impact that I think getting sober has had for me. It's able, once again, for me to be present. I'm interested in the challenges that you're seeing now. We've talked about the positive aspects and how you're able to do things. I guess what are some of the things that you're struggling with, if any? You could have left if any out of that because you don't go through life without challenges. Like, it's just not possible. That's certainly true for me. And it, the challenges are, there's a mix. There's everyday challenges, which is being broke and trying to afford $5 gas and $8 gallons of milk. And those, those are real challenges, but it's not the end of the world anymore. Like... With my ex-wife, you know, we would fight over money and it was this anxiety and this insecurity too because I wasn't working a job that I felt had prospects and and it just became this source of contention. And now, listen, I'm like millions of other people who make ends meet and still try to live a normal life. You know, going back to what you were saying, Chris, about what this program has taught us, one of the things it's taught me is that my problems are not unique, which, you know, we've talked about, but they still require handling. They still require me to take responsibility. The biggest challenge for me and for, you know, my girlfriend, we came into this relationship with children of our own, 
making a concerted effort to parent together, to be a unit, to be a team, to do this truthfully together, not just pay it lip service. I was the master at doing that with my ex-wife. It was not a joint effort. It was, I thought I knew best based on my own previous experiences. I thought I knew better than anybody else. And yeah, it was just, it made me an insufferable bastard. And if you ask Amanda, she'll probably tell you I'm still an insufferable bastard some days. But I'm really quick to apologize. I'm really quick to acknowledge my role. And more, more than just apologize, acknowledge my role and understand what my role in something is, whether that's positive or negative. And so making this concerted effort to not just do this as a unit, but to support her too. Like that's been really, really important to support her. She has her own recovery journey that she's engaged in. And so being able to support her in all of those different facets um, has been really, really challenging. Not because it's challenging to support her, but it's challenging to try to thread that needle of somebody allowing someone the space to travel their own road versus the guy that thought he knew everything. So I'm very interested in knowing how you fit your recovery program into all of this. You're talking about using the program that you knew before having this new child and I don't have children. I don't have a plan to have children anytime soon. And I can only imagine how busy it is just from what you've shared here. And from what I know from all my other friends who have children and I'm just interested to know, like, how do you fit it all in? It wasn't easy to maintain as Listeners of the podcast might know, uh, I do a daily Zoom meeting. My first two daughters were C-sections. Avery was a natural birth. And so the buildup was completely different. With a C-section, you literally pick a date on the calendar, and as long as everything goes okay, you go in that morning and you have a kid in the afternoon. It's pretty cut and dry. With a traditional birth, you're just sit, kind of sitting and waiting. Her due date was July 11th, and we were down the shore for the 4th of July, and we were going home that Tuesday on the 5th. Uh, Amanda woke up on the 5th and was like, we got to get home. Something's, something's off. And we get home. We go to the hospital. She's born at 12.02 the morning of the 6th. And there was no, like, preparation for adapting my program there was no like ability to be like okay i know this is happening and i'm going to do this this and this and again not having been a parent of a newborn in seven years the learning curve it wasn't steep but it was still there it took me probably about a week to remember that and i was talking with chris about this that thing that you do as a parent where you sleep like two to three hours in spurts, in just pockets. And it, like that time of day is like any time of day. It could be four in the afternoon, four in the morning, noon, midnight, whatever. And so being able to hit that same meeting, I couldn't do it. And I also knew that I wasn't going to be as simple as, well, I'll just find a later meeting. Because again, if I'm asleep at seven o'clock or four in the, whatever it is, uh, even though I was off from work, I was kind of anticipating being able to make more meetings. I couldn't make meetings because I was 7.15 in the morning. I was trying to catch up on sleep. So to counteract that, I made sure that I was in touch with people from my home group. The, the purpose of that had twofold. One is to just let everybody know, hey, listen, I didn't fall off the face of the earth. I didn't relapse. I didn't you know, mention the pregnancy to them at all because we kind of wanted it to be a bit of a surprise. And also just to stay connected. For me, that was really more important at that point was staying connected than the message. It wasn't necessarily at that point about signing in and hearing the reading. And it was about staying connected to people in the group and people who had gone through fatherhood and their wife's pregnancy in sobriety, in recovery. And there, there was a good network of guys that I had from that meeting 
that really helped me. You make plans, God laughs. That's, you know, we all know that saying. And that was really what happened here because I was for sure like, all right, now I'm going to get to hit my morning meeting every single day. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, wait a second. No, you're not. You're not going to do this at all. You're going to have to work to maintain your recovery and maintain your connection. And really it was an opportunity for me to participate more in my recovery. Um, I couldn't take service commitments. I couldn't do things that I enjoyed like uh, CPC or I completely forgot about the GSR meeting in July. And thankfully our GSR was pretty good. He's a great guy and totally understood. And it's, it's one of those things that it kind of was an eye opener that a relapse can hit you when you're not expecting it. And I, I never really understood what people in the rooms meant when like it snuck up on them. And I do understand that now. You mentioned staying connected. That is something I would say I struggle with too. And being a parent, you're very busy. And I find myself Self, being very overwhelmed, tired, stressed. I mean, just today I woke up at 3.30, drove to Connecticut, came home, had a cook dinner, put the kids to bed, jump on this podcast. And these are things I want to do in my life, but I find myself dropping the ball on some areas of my life all the time. And that's the biggest thing I think I struggle with. Um, like today, my father said, you know, you haven't uh, reached out to me. You haven't given me time. So in the last week, I haven't called him enough. Sometimes my mom says, you know, I haven't talked to her. Sometimes my house, you know, I haven't mowed the lawn, right? So there's all these parts in my life that I find aren't getting enough attention at times, but I am doing my best. I'm definitely cognizant that I'm lacking in certain areas. The thing I would say about being sober now is it's not overwhelming my life and I'm able to ask for help. I don't have this pride and ego where before I would say, oh, I'm going to do it all. Oh, I could be there for everyone. I could never say no. That was a big thing too. So I think that's the, you know, and I know I'm kind of all over the place with this sentence, but I'm able to say no, I'm able to ask for help. And my pride and ego is not there where those things don't intertwine. We started this Santa business and that's taking up some more time in my life. What I love about this is it's a family business and there's this trust there. And the reason I brought up trust in this parenting thing is before the whole family would never have trust me with this. The family now trusts me enough to be part of this business. And I, I really appreciate that. Ben, the early stages of parenting, you're all over. You have sleepless nights. And I just applaud you on your two years. And you're doing a great job. So this is wonderful. And I think we've been talking about how you are experiencing recovery, experiencing parenthood with younger kids. And I know both of you have kids who are more mature, not teenagers yet. Um, however, you've been parents for longer than newborns, right? So I want to approach a topic around shame and how the two of you have dealt with the shame of your past and if it has carried into shame as it relates to your children, either putting shame upon your children, having shame for missing opportunities. I know this is a deep question, but I think it's relevant to this topic of parenting because as we are young and growing and developing, how do you deal with that feeling of I was the way that I was before getting sober and now I'm trying to be and live a recovered life. So can you guys just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, for me, it's shame and guilt. They're synonymous. I don't think I can have one without the other. And they are different. I think for me, guilt is feeling bad about not being the dad that I wanted to be. And the shame is kind of that embarrassment of feeling branded or received that way. And I didn't let that 
reality really hold me down for very long. It was something that I wanted to kind of tackle sooner rather than later because my addiction, while it was not the sole catalyst for the dissolution of my marriage to the mother of my daughters, it certainly aided in it. And so what I try to do now is I really take, you know, the notion of everything happens exactly the way it's supposed to happen. Acceptance is the answer. Accepting life on life's terms and realizing that I can't dwell on having not been a great dad um, to the girls when, when they were growing up. And now I look at it as opportunity. If I feel that shame or that guilt, it's an opportunity to make up for those deficiencies. We've touched on it in previous episodes about, you know, to our kids, it's kind of like a living amends. Julie's 11 going on 12. So the teenager comments are, you know, they're hitting close to home because it's, it's happening. It's, she's, she's two years from high school. I'm going to throw up. So she would understand an apology. She would understand what I was talking about. But is that the best that I can do? Is apologizing the best that I can do? And I don't think it is. I think the best that I can do is, to Chris's point earlier, is to be present. You know, just because parents are drinking on the sidelines of their kids' soccer practice doesn't make them an alcoholic. But what it does make them is somebody who hasn't had the good fortune of having a spiritual experience through this program that allows them to not want to miss out, to want to stay present. And so it really is a um, difficult at the outset when, when I first think about it, but it gets easier and easier because I know that there's something I can do to, to correct for it. There's something I can do uh, to make up for it in some small way. Diving into that shame and guilt is a little too self-centered for me because I don't want to feel sorry for myself at this point. What I want to feel is the need to be better. I definitely have shame and guilt still. I wish I didn't. I've worked with my therapist to get over that. It's something that I agree is kind of self-centered. And you said uh, it's self-centered, right? And things are selfish. The irony of this is in order to be a good parent, you have to be selfish. You have to put your recovery first to be a better parent. Because the easiest way to be a shitty father is to relapse. I mean, it's just plain and simple. If we relapse, we're going to be either lying to our children, lying to our wives, lying to our husbands, whoever it is, you're going to be lying to your children and you're going to be a shitty father. And that's something I did when early on in my child's life. Now, I have not made amends to, you know, a two-year-old, a five-year-old. I'm trying to make living amends. And eventually I will talk with them about why I don't drink. My daughter actually made a comment when we were in Cape May, and she said, why are you only drinking water when they're drinking soda? Soda was what my whole family, I think there was 25 of us, and everyone was drinking. Once again, kids are very aware. They're very smart. They're astute. They're, they're observant, right? And, you know, I just said I like the taste. But later on, I almost want, wish I came up with a better answer, and I didn't want to force the subject. But to answer, Jason, your question, I still carry around this shame and guilt of why couldn't I get sober for them? And I know the answer, but it's that feeling that I can't get out of my out of my core. Like I said, I'm working with through the steps with it. My therapist, I talk to people all the time. I talk to friends, family. I read about it and it's slowly dissipating, but it's still there at the core. The more I work through it, the less it has control over me. Other things that I do to mitigate that feeling is communicating a lot with people around me. And being a parent, although stressful at times, is one of the most rewarding things. And I don't want to have that taken from me from a relapse. So working through that shame and guilt so I don't relapse again is a necessity to being a good parent. So, Ben, I just want to comment on one thing that you mentioned. So you talked about your daughter, and as she grows up, 
when she turns 21, if she turns out to be an alcoholic or a drug addict, what's that going to be like for you? How would you guys handle having one of your children be one of us? How exactly I would handle it, it's a bit of a fruitless venture because there's a billion things that could happen between now and then. The only thing I can say for certain is that as long as I'm alive and I'm sober and I'm working a program, I can continue to be an example of an easier way. Not, you know, drowning her in the big book. Um, really kind of taking what they talk about and working with others and talking about just sharing my experience with her and how not being able to be in control made my life harder, how it made me not able to deal with certain issues, how it made me avoid certain issues. Um, and it's not something that I'm ignorant to. It's a very real possibility. It's funny because one of the guys that I talked to, whose uh, his son's two or three now, and his father is also one of us. And, you know, I take a lot of cues from how that was handled. His father didn't force him into the rooms. He allowed him to experience that, experience that feeling of failure, experience that pain. Because without that pain, you don't understand what it means to recover. If I tried to shield them from that, if I tried to use this experience that I've gone through and try to, you know, protect them from something, it wouldn't work because I had to go through so much pain and anguish, um, you know, before I got sober, when I got sober, and while I've been sober, if I didn't go through those things, it would just be a story that could happen to somebody else, but those kinds of things don't happen to me. I've actually discussed this with my wife at length. The biggest thing that I would love to say I wouldn't do is give more shame and guilt to my daughter, my son. And that's something a lot of people did for me. They made me feel like shit about it. They said, well, you're effed up because of this. Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? And it's not that they wanted to hurt me. They were just hurt and that's how they took it out on me. I would love to also say I wouldn't enable that person. How hard would it be? I mean, Ben, if your daughter came and needed money at a time and in your head, you're like, this is a terrible decision. Not saying like as black and white as, hey, I need $100 to go buy drugs, but to shut the door on your kid, knowing that they have to find their way. It's such a hard thing to project out. So I would love to say I'm there for them. I would not enable my child this, that, but it's something that I think, Ben, you hit the nail on the head is you just have to lead by example. All I know is from what I've seen and what I know of the two of you, you're both great parents. You are now setting examples for your children and you're setting examples for all of us. So I want to congratulate you on being wonderful fathers. So that's all for tonight. Ben, it was great seeing you again. I'm so happy to hear that you're doing well. And as always, each and every one of our episodes is dedicated to the still sick and suffering alcoholic and addict, especially the individual who's going to pick up for the first time tonight. Have a great night, guys. Have a great night. Have a great night. We appreciate your liking and subscribing to our podcast. If you liked what you heard today and would like to support our podcast, feel free to Venmo a dollar to our virtual basket at Sober Solutions Podcast. We want to hear from you too. If you have a comment, question, topic, or would like to come on the show, find us on Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube at Sober Solutions Podcast. Or you can shoot us an email to Sober Solutions Podcast at gmail.com. Find us on Apple Podcast and Spotify. And if you like what you've heard, make sure to subscribe, rate, and review the show.